currently he is a group leader and principal investigator of Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at both at Broad Institute with joint faculty appointments at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and an investigator at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He ultimately wants to develop therapies that can elevate and treat mental disorders. He is an academic council member of the Academy of Comparative Philosophy and Religion. I welcome you, sir. Dr. Sharma Ji, who is a neuroscientist from the United States of America, happens to be the great and ardent follower of Dr. 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 And our sister, Professor and Dr. Ashwini Jo from Solapur. She is also the trustee member of this academy. I also welcome and ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Uh, Joe, and all the, the, the honored guests and uh, faculty members. I welcome you all and I hope uh, I am able to do justice in this. Uh, I am so grateful to the academy, uh, Ms. Especially Mr. Jerry, uh, for the kind invitation to deliver this lecture. Named after Sri Guru Dev, who is also my, my guru, um, who as a starting uh, philosopher, professor, Ms. Dati described, Guru Dev was a person of extraordinary greatness, matchless intellect, um, uh, emotional depth of humanity, sympathy, love, and keen sense of duty and consciousness. Sri Guru Dev, through his implicit devotion, made in his guru. Sri uh, Mahasai Maharaj first realized that his own body was a temple of God. His expectation and motivation interest and affect uh, what we do, what we think, and what we predict and behave in this world. Over the last 10 or 15 years, I have invested much of my research into understanding psychiatric disorders. Um, and conditions such as autism, but I don't talk to talk about that. It's an it's a extensive lecture which I'll do sometime later. Um, let me start with uh, the fact that um, what I'll try to do is help you think about consciousness. Um, we all are conscious, we know that. But we cannot adequately decide. The reason is it's, it's, it's a feeling of some kind that is not uh, easily put into words. Uh, it has been a problem that has been a subject of intense um, sort of research and speculation by philosophers, psychologists, um, uh, mathematicians, brain modelers, as well as researchers like me, who have for, for, for the longest time to all ages in the world over have thought about it and have tried to sort of understand how to define consciousness. The modern research continues to do that and find newer tools. And I hope that in the in, in near future we have a better understanding of this, this complex problem. However, as said, there are many more questions and answers. I begin by facing the fully some of these questions that current researchers on consciousness have begun to formulate. But first, I'll begin um, by quoting uh, prospect, our own experience, experience in the physical consciousness. So it is basically, it is something which is not really easily describable, which makes it a hard problem. An extreme view of heart problem is that it is all illusion. It is just something that we need not worry about. And because it is just there, it is some kind of a big kind of imagination or a big thing. Others who want to understand that since it is so universal, it is subjectively intuitive that leaves a pure proper theoretical foundation that can be never expected. So this is where we are. Some people say that it is all illusion. We need not worry about this. There are other people who say, no, it is there. We have 
because we know it is there. We cannot deny it. And we need to find ways to understand it and, and encapsulate it to an extent to prove on things. I don't know whether it is possible, but it's something that many researchers want to do. So, in terms of building the conception of the energy experience as a physical and mental stimuli, the first two, the physical and mental stimuli, comes to the easy problem because we have made a lot of progress in understanding that. We don't have full answers, but there are ways that we can, we can sort of uh, uh, experiment them and find proof to know that there is a mental uh, aspect of sensory experience that can be experimented for us um, in, a, in a neighborhood that suddenly we saw a couple of people who stood there and I said, oh what a beautiful day. We did not know that and we thought, yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's sunny, it's bright and so we thought maybe people are so, so nice and so, so polite here that they want to greet us. But over the years, we found out that we didn't see blue. The right to the sky is indeed a very precious thing because in the northern part of the USA, there are many more cloudy days, dark and murky days, that seeing the right to the sky, it does make you very happy. But again, like this is a this is a feeling of happiness which is internally generated. Blue sky does not need to have. Uh, anything special about it, but we feel happy and we express it. So what is that, that sense of happiness that comes about when we see something so so alive and so, so bright? Uh, are there some cells in our brain that actually oscillate as with some magical frequency that creates a feeling of happiness, elation, sadness or pain? and it goes to the entire brain and go to the back of my brain where they first start to get processed. Okay. Um, and it is a brain that, that creates the complex output by using very simple stimuli. The stimuli that come from our eyes are very simple like ideas of light or dark or brightness. Even the color is, 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 is created by specific cells in the retina and they are integrated as blue, green, red, or some other combination of colors by everything. So it is a brain which makes up everything from very simple inputs. So brain uses a simple inputs to create complex outputs. Um, in Pathu Bhagavad in Hindi literature, Gurudev Ramade has quoted a passage which says the inter incommunicativeness of the senses. Uh, there is a Doha from Kabi which says, Jo deke so kahe nahi, kahe so deke nahi. One who sees does not hear, and one who hears does not see. Which means eyes do not hear and ears do not see. And each organ conveys only one sensory information. But later on, some other, and in some other passage, he says that there is a, is a possibility of interchangeability of sensory perception in spiritual experiences. Uh, he has quoted um, great characteristics like Mahika Bishop, Kurundadas, and Kabir, where uh, they have expressed their spiritual experiences to say that eyes may be able to hear and ears may be able to see. Um, the same thing has been echoed by um, a great European philosopher, René Descartes, is doctrine of self-consciousness. I'm not a philosopher, so I won't go into the great details of this, but there is some echo of similar subjective experience, which is uh, echoed by, by great philosophers also. There's a famous picture uh, in a Italian in gallery, it's a, big, uh, a lady with a fat, which is very famous. So, parrot is like a mongoose, and when it is born, the parrot pup has a brain which is about the quarter size of my my, uh, uh, my thumbnail. So, but since it is born at a time of uh, we know that its retinal connections have reached about the middle part of the brain. So, since they have not reached their final address, they are unable to change. And as an engineer, we thought that maybe we can change this circuit by doing something physical. 
and this is what exactly I, I love doing very, very precise microsurgery for weeks and then I was able to, to read out the selections on the retina to go to an area which processes sound or the auditory cortex. So I also set up the connections from the ears which were coming from the cochlea to the auditory cortex so that they don't compete with the CD. Now, so this is exactly what I did. I, I take the retinal connections to go to the hearing area and cut off the, the area that talks with sound and the ability to cut for us. And then we ask, what is special about <coughs> this visual input, which is now going to a totally new area of the brain, which is not supposed to be processing. So it will be two things. It will be totally rejected and the, the animal will be totally blind. Changing some of the genetic code can change that behavior and how to change it back by gene therapy. This is exactly what I'm, we are doing right now. So we have a set of uh, animal translating animal models in which we are doing gene therapy to see if we can change their particle like tendencies. So that is something we do all the time. Um, coming back to uh, the system, um, so there is a, there is a possibility of interchangeability of sensory system, at least physically, which can mimic what people, what some say is called um, interchangeability of sensory system. But all I have done is uh, a one sense change to another sense. Um, sense as for multi-sensory experience and interchangeability of multiple senses in the same in some sort of a catalytic as to the uh, way forward. Going on, how about the mental state? The state that do not require a physical stimulus. Um, when a child is born, very early on, about two years of age, the child is able to do some mind reading. They are able to say, uh, if you have say meaning out of why a person is standing and what are its intentions, where he or she is looking and what are their facial expressions, are they, is, the, is the person looking angry or happy or friendly. It's about two years of age that the child starts to, to learn about it. And they are also able to write by age three or four, they are also able to predict the intentions of people. So consciousness does develop but the question is where, when, when in the in the development time frame, the a, a brain or a, a brain of a child can be said to be conscious. What is the minimum state of consciousness that must happen when we can say that yes, this this brain is now conscious? So um, there are two main theories. Uh, that people have been uh, uh, putting forward. One is an early emergent theory and the other one is maybe what is say. The early emergent theory proponents will say that consciousness actually starts very early in the womb, about 30, 30 to 35 weeks of gestation period when a, 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 a fetus is supposed to have uh, show some signs of, of conscious perception. They react to changes that are something like a conscious uh, change that we do when we are in the rather than when we are in the I want to do this in our, uh, uh, in our models because we want to understand how autism, the brain network of autism, how different from, from children, and from normal children. And can we change them so that when we do these therapy or any other therapy, those networks actually do become more normal or not. So these are very important experiments that allow us to understand the disease mechanisms and how healthy is their change and we can get a, a specific sort of a biomarker for the change. Then people have done experiments that for giant attention. A child, I'll show you all. So this is next slide. So this is the default model uh, where you can actually the model. You can see on the, on the, the left side, there are three sort of sections of the brain, and you, you can see there are specific parts of the brain which are lighted up when the person is at rest. It is not doing anything, just lying. And when a, a baby of a three-month-old baby is put in a stand, 
you can see almost the same way as the light of the same way and the baby is just lying to us to the sweet. So this is the default work of this and the baby and the baby is not attentively doing anything. When you start to use the brain for some other processes, this activity goes down. When you center the brain in there, it starts to get activity. So we can do a better and get state of the brain. So this is the default work with this science. But the brain is alive, even if you are sleeping or even at light and it's easier, the same brain activity is still doing this. His name is Jose uh, Barbicu. Uh, in Stanford University, they have started to make uh, an atlas of the brain of uh, the conscious experience. So, um, many, many patients with, uh, with surgical emergencies like um, epilepsy or, or tumors and all, they have to get their parts of the brain, a tissue of the brain which is not going to correctly that has to be removed. And if they can decide the, what part of the, of the cells are where which are ever it has to be removed, uh, the neurons are in those electrodes in the top of the brain for get electrodes to stimulate those areas and ask the person who is awake uh, what are they doing. And these are a big patient to work with for the government and the surgery, but they are able to tell their own sensory experience. And what is amazing is that they are sophisticated in the brain when they are stimulated. You have a subjective feeling which can be expressed. For example, in the area of brain, uh, we say that when it is stimulated electrically, a person feels dizzy. They say, I am feeling dizzy. Okay. Another area of brain, when you stimulate, you, you have a feeling of fear. And this is very universal. The same area, when it's stimulated by, uh, by uh, electrical stimulation with different people, they have the same set of experiences. So it's a universal experience which is back to a specific area of the brain. Which does not mean that the rest of the brain is not working at that time, but it is this area only which, when we stimulate it, when they have the subjective feeling of fearfulness or feeling like um, sort of pain or feeling good or tingling in the leg or seeing bright blue color of, of stars or something like this. No, brain cannot switch food. There are, and it's very easy to food. And that also is, is, a, is a problem in the sense that many, when, when a, when a saint or, or a, a spiritual person is saying that we are having, um, we can hear our thoughts. So for me, I'm not very person I am not very personal I must always be sure for giving up a person like this. Many of the concepts to be in Jagannath's newspaper, but he explained in a nice, simple way. When there is a case to be asking me to be mysterious for the function, I was very careful. Uh, I tried to avoid to go to functions when the two words are there, because of your intuition. Because I am a non believer I don't believe in any word. And I don't want to attend a function where I have to say something which will not be acceptable to the majority of the audience. But over the period of time, uh, my father taught us that it is up to you whether you want to believe in the God or you don't want to believe in the God, you need to decide. So I decided that I will not believe in the God. But I was great, especially after the battle in the age of 16, I started to believe that there is something which some people call as God. But there is something in which you have to believe. Especially when the circumstances will you give acceptance. So slowly over a period of time I started believing to the concept of God. So when the people say that you come and be the case for functional, I said, okay, I go and I did try to understand uh, these things more because I am so just serious. And also academy, and uh, I promise you that I will continue to be guided by the people as well as I will keep in contact with the uh, centre. And also, uh, if it is possible, I would like to attend some of the Thank you. 
So Sri Gurudev Ranade proposed uh, a very exciting as I can be. Um, he basically was a pioneer in creating a spiritual movement which was universal because it is rational, it is mystical, it is spiritual and it is also something that uh, does not differentiate between different religions, different human beings um, and almost all forms of, of, of living beings. And so uh, it is something which anybody can follow without any caste or creed or religion or anything. So it is something which I think is, a, is an ultimate form of uh, benevolent humanism.